First off, I'd like to thank ADM for sponsoring my, uh, my talk today. Um, whenever you hear financial matrix, people tend to go, oh my god, more numbers. Hopefully today, you'll be able to walk away with at least one bit of information that you can use on your, your dairy. So, in the dairy industry, and in many businesses, because I've been involved in some other companies as well, is a lot of them wait to year end uh, before making business decisions. And uh, today I'm going to challenge you on that, that thought process. So I was just out of dairy yesterday, actually, and uh, they are in the same boat. They need to purchase more land, but we had to wait to year end because the books uh, weren't back yet. But when we went through the books, there's no indicators in there would say that they could or could not. So what I'd like to challenge you on is why should we wait till the year end before moving forward on it? So today's talk, what we're gonna be looking at is um, a summary of herd costs from real dairies. Uh, in Quebec and Ontario. I have some from British Columbia and the East Coast as well, but I've decided I'll keep it uh, in the, these two provinces. Then we're going to move into uh, finding uh, opportunities in the details. So I've pulled some of the details out from some of these dairies to show you what they're doing in operating costs. Then I'm going to look at some real opportunities. And then we're going to look at the results, some of the numbers. And at the end, I'll close with my opinion. So I challenge you to think of when you're on your dairy, um, do you look at what percentage of your gross revenue goes to the different departments of your dairy? And today, hopefully, what I've done is looked at 37 different dairies located in Ontario, Quebec, the real numbers. So the production numbers come from 2013, but I looked at their 2014 books when they came through up to 2016. So I've got two and a half to three years of data that I've pulled out from these different dairies. Then what I did is I corrected the thousands of data points to 100 kilos a quota. I corrected the component pricing to 2016 which gave me $687,736 of gross revenue on 100 kilos in quota on 2016 milk prices. So we're going to be talking about last year's milk prices. All of the cost analysis were done in referencing gross milk revenue. So, let's start. So when you look at your variable costs for cows, and what I've done is I've included your lactating cows and your dry cows in this scenario. All of it again, I keep repeating this so we understand, is the variable cost as a percent of gross revenue for 100 kilos a quarter. The average dairy in this 37 uh, uh, herds was costing 51.8% of their milk check. Went to, to pay for feed, vet costs, fuels, um, any variable cost. It represented $356,247 of that $687,700 I mentioned earlier. That's a significant amount of chunk change. Then I broke it out and I said, of the 37 dairies, Top performers, it only cost them 44.7%, 40, representing significant difference when you look at the highest, 63.1%. If you look at that difference, so within 100 kilos of quota, the management style of these 37, uh, 37 dairies there was a difference of $126,546. So people have often said to me, Devin, we're within a quota system, there's no way 
that I can increase my revenue. Maybe not, unless you purchase quota. But there is a way to find margin within your quota. And I've been doing this long enough to tell you that I haven't been on a dairy yet where we couldn't find an opportunity in there. So this is just for the lactating and dry cows. Keep that in mind. Then I looked at the heifers, replacement stock. The average for these, the replacement animals, was 11.9%, or $81,841, of the $687,700 that we, uh, we were generating gross revenue. Earlier, I think, somebody was talking in another presentation about cost for heifers. People always come up with numbers between $2,000 to $3,000 to raise a heifer. What if I were to tell you that that is not a true representation of your financial well-being when you're looking at true milk revenues as a percentage? And I'll show you later why. So some of these guys, it only costs them 7.2% of their milk revenue. And the higher end was up to 14.7. So within 100 kilos of quota, corrected the best dairies, cost them $49,517. Some of the least efficient ones, $101,000 which represent $51,580 difference between well uh, or efficient dairies and those that are less efficient for, for uh, raising replacement stock within 100 kilos of quota. That's a significant amount of money. And you're kind of going, where can I find that on my dairy? As the talk progresses, hopefully you'll see where we can find that. People always talk about it costs too much for this and that on the dairy. And typically, what is the one that costs the most money? Feed. And typically, it's when you write the check to the feed company. What if I were to say, what does it cost you to make a dollar on your dairy farm? So what I've done here is, I've said, I'm going to include your depreciation, your debt servicing, your taxes, and all variable and fixed costs from all these 37 dairies into this. And what I did is I said, the average dairy, it costs 81 cents to make a dollar on these dairies. So they're left with a difference of 19 cents at the end of the year to put back into the business or dividends or whatever they may choose to do. The Lowest cost, guys, down to 68 cents. Remember, I've got debt load included in that, depreciation scales, taxes, variable, and fixed costs included in that calculation. Those that are in trouble, and unfortunately, this particular dairy, um, I was invited to come in and help them because the bank called me. And if the bank calls me to come out to your dairy, it's probably not a good thing. So there's only four cents. There's no room for any surprises on that dairy at all. Then I'd like to move into finding opportunity in the details. So now I've taken the big picture, what it costs to make a dollar. We've looked at variable cost for lactating dry, and we looked at replacement stock. So now I'd like to take a look at feeding the cow. So now feeding your lactating and dry cow always has the percentage of your variable cost. So on the homegrown side, we have as low as 7.1% up to 18.9% of their costs, the variable cost, true cost, the dairy, for 100 kilos of quarter, correct it out. So there's a significant change here, $80,000 for homegrown product 
on these dairies. Purchased range from 12.9 percent all the way up to 27.9. Remember, some of them, some of these dairies had very efficient costs when it came to home growing, but their purchase was higher. Whereas other were very inefficient on their home growing, but what they purchased was low. Total feed costs. So homegrown and your purchase cost to feed the lactating and dry cow is low as 23.1% of your gross revenue on 100 kilos of quota up to 37.2. People will say to me, by the way, what if I buy my feed? Well, there were three dairies in this group that bought all of their grain. And you would think it would cost them more. It did not in their particular case. These three dairies had calculated that it was not in their best interest to produce their own grain corn. So they bought it in as a complete feed. And they were not the ones that had the highest feed bill. They sat somewhere in the middle. So then I broke it up and I said, what other costs do we have on a dairy? How many of you here run TMRs? Right, a lot of people run TMRs. This is a, a classic example of we don't realize how much it costs in fuel to make, make our TMRs. Lowest guys, 0.7, highest 3.1. On the fuel cost things, I'll, sh I'll be talking about that in a minute, but a real story on one of the dairies. The veterinary costs. Veterinary costs is his hours on your dairy plus all drugs, just so I understand what that includes in there. 1.8% on these 37 dairies is the most efficient, up to 5.3% of the gross revenue. That's that $687,730 odd dollars. Again, within the same, why is one so much more than the other? Labor. Again, I'm only looking at lactating and dry cows. I've taken the hours allocated to this group of animals and costed it out for you. As low as 7.6% or 52,000, up to over 90,000 at 13.2%. Labor for lactating and dry cows only. So, I'm going to bring it to real opportunity. So all those numbers you, you saw earlier, I'm now going to talk to them in real terms. But before I do that, this is something that Alex Bach came out with and I found it really interesting. What he did is he looked at 47 dairies, okay, with the similar genetics, and they were fed the same TMR. So the TMR came from one central spot. The variance from farm to farm, the, from the, the highest to lowest, was 14 liters per cap, the yield. And you can say there's a lot of variables in there. The reason I found this really interesting is how many times do we blame the feed guy or the vet or there's it's always somebody else that I can't get the milk. Often it has nothing to do with the feed. If you look at it, 56% in his trial had were non-dietary factors that were impacting the performance of these dairies. And that's what I found in these 37 Canadian dairies as well. So it could be feed management, uh, feed bunk space, number of push-ups, TMR, uh, many other things. Stall design, management, number of cows fed, uh, uh, bed type, sand, mat, or none, etc. Age of first calving, days of milk, ventilation, grouping strategies, first lactation group, um, dry cows, the list goes on. They're, on, they're all non-dietary things that we should look at. I gotta, how many here have a management team that they have to come in and audit what they're doing? Just a quick raise of hand. 
Not very many. I, I'm involved in a dairy as well as, um, as an investor. And I can tell you that we audit every six months what we're doing on the dairy. We have the team come in and take a look at what are we doing well. We have a, a plan. Are we doing it well? Have we obtained that plan? If we haven't, why not? So if I ask you this question, if I had these two herds, the very same TMR, okay, which would perform best? Show of hands, who would think number one? Nobody. Who thinks that number two would perform better? Yeah, there's hands up for number two. Right, so there's a classic example where we talked about variable costs. This barn over here was a newly built barn and had to be re redesigned because cows were not using the stall. But there's an example of brand new facility, we're now carrying the debt load, but we're not getting the return on this investment. So if you have capital investment moving forward, and I was just on a Quebec dairy three weeks ago, a robot facility. Cement, I find this completely uh, unacceptable. Cement was poured, four robots are in the facility, they're still putting the stalls in. Uh, I was brought in as an outside advisor on it, walked up and down the facility. They had designed four foot stalls, but nobody paid attention to the contractors and the designer. The last stalls on the end rows, and there's four in rows, weren't even three feet wide. And nobody caught it. So, and I've been in a lot of facilities that way. So any of you that are investing capital, get a third party in there to review everything with you. I found this interesting. The way to read this lifetime production cabin at 26 months. So she's born, your heifer, she costs you money, she calves out, she starts to pay you back. She goes dry and she only starts to actually generate enough revenue to, at 40 months of age. The reason this is important, so then if I take her and I calve her out at 24 months, same principle, she calves out, she costs me money, the calf does, 24 months she's born, goes dry, but now it's 38 months versus 40 months that she starts to generate positive cash flow for you. So this kind of thinking becomes very important in your process. Then I looked at inventories, so animal inventories for 100 animals, so this is dry cows and lactating cows, 100 cows. 9% call rate on your replacement animals, that means she's born alive, before she gets to the pipeline, 9% of them die. And you might say, that's too high for my dairy. I challenge you to go back and count those numbers. And I bet you, without a show of hands, there's a lot of you who have never looked at your call rate on your replacement animals. It highly impacts your inventory. So now I'm calving at 26 months and I put in a 30% call rate for the cows. So it's 81 heifers required. If I look at the same 100 cows and I calve at 24 months, same call rates, I only need 73 heifers. So therein lies some of the issue. If you only calculate your cost to raise a heifer but you do not control your inventories, your cost to your revenue may be higher than you think. So now I'm going to delve into some more cost control. So fuel consumption when feeding the herd. This is a real story. This dairy was blown away when, I, when we found this out. Whoops. Opportunity with homegrown feeds. That's always, I was told by the, uh, or the uh, producer said, I was told my cost per acre is ranked amongst the highest in the area. So in his head, his cost per acre was better than anybody else in the region, so he should be doing fine. He wasn't. The hidden opportunities at the feed bunk. I'm talking about that in a minute. Oops. 
an opportunity working with the management team, hence why I asked the question earlier, how the vet, mill, rep, and myself, and producer, found margins. So the real results. So here it is. This is from the, I picked the dairy, we corrected it. This is numbers that came out three years. So we did an audit on this in 2014, of the 2013 numbers, the 27.5. He was calving them. Three years later, he's calving at 24 with a lot of management. It represented $11,000 on variable reduction of variable costs by moving that way. There's going to be greater wins there as yet. It's not finished, that story. But these are it's real numbers. This particular dairy had incredibly high inventory of animals. So we reduced it from 118% of his cows, so we saw a percentage above, down 80% of his population. And that was done through controlling his culls. The vet was involved in this. We changed his protocols. Reduced his numbers, done over a two and a half year period. And this is what it meant in these real numbers in 2016 corrected. It was $33,000. There's a lot of hidden margin that we don't know about. Being aware of the TMR mixing time. This is the dairy that was using baleage to feed his cattle as well. There, he had an, inherently another problem. He was using two systems. He had baleage and he had bunks. So he had, he had his silage equipment and a baler. So inherently had a problem there as well. But this problem was his mixing time. He would put his round bales in a twin screw before he'd go into for breakfast. He typically would think, I'm going to go in and have breakfast, I'll be out in 40 minutes, but he said, invariably, he got a phone call. And he said, two hours later, he'd come out and the tractor's like full on and the mixture's still running. This cost him $13,000 additional cost and fuel cost by running his TMR. What we ended up doing is we found a neighbor who had been looking for a hay chopping mechanism, I won't say the name of which one. They shared the cost of it. We amortized that piece of equipment over only five years. So he, he got 1.9% back. That is after he, the money is borrowed for the unit and all the fuel costs are still cal uh, calculated into it. The net was 1.9%. So he's paid for his chopping unit. He's reduced his mixing time. He has a better mix. Part of this as well is he, will, he has seen a, a response in production as well. Physical and the financials. So cost to grow an acre of forage does not indicate production efficiency. So this guy was $123 an acre, less than anybody else in the region. It required 2.6 acres of forage to feed one cow versus 1.9 in his area. First audit of his numbers from uh, summer of 2013, and second audit was performed summer of 20 for the uh, year of 2015. Forge management practices needed to be addressed. This is the side of the bunk, by the way. He would open the side wall to go in because he had a forge that he wanted to get at. He was a least cost producer. He used very little fertilizer. He hated to write checks. But between inefficiencies in the field, so the acreage going up per animal unit, and his inefficiencies at the feed bunk, correcting all of that was the biggest win of everything. There was $62,000 we found within the $167,700 that we originally had as a gross milk revenue. And these are things that, sure, they don't happen overnight. Everybody wants to pick the lowest hanging apple. But if you put a plan in place, these are real numbers that you, you folks can get. And we've done it ourselves in the dairies that I've been involved with.
So, I don't know how many of you folks calculate your total refusal dry matter, but this fellow was 11.4%. At the feed bunk was his dry matter, and it was done deliberately because he wanted to feed his heifers. He didn't want to make another mix. We reduced it to 5.1% refusals. We did calculate the value of refusals to the heifers versus making uh, the rest of it with the heifer mix. So that was calculated into what I'm about to show you. When we pu pull out all the numbers, it's quite interesting. It was $16,500 net in variable costs. Stop and think about it. If you, if you beat up, let's, let's pick on the feed guy. Beat the feed guy up for 20 bucks a ton. I just did the math to the, earlier. Beat him up for $20 a ton. On 4.5 kilo feed rate on a, a product, and I put 1.3 kilos of fat per cow to, uh, to produce 100 kilos of quota, it represents only 0.38% margin. And I've seen some really good people get fired from dairies versus working with these people to find this kind of, of margin in there. So we worked with the vet on this one. I found this one really interesting. So it's the vet that said, it costs too much for me to be here. And it started a discussion, and then the feed mill rep got involved in it, and then I was asked to get involved with the producer. So we had to find, how could we reduce this veterinarian bill by reducing the hours on farm per herd health? And we found reproductive uh, inefficiencies re uh, reduced, partly because of protocol drift. So let me talk a little bit with the vet veterinarian question was saying. He says, I come to your dairy, I spend basically half an hour to 30 minutes running after cows to try and find who I need to, to check today, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He said, there's basically 40 minutes of my time here is spent herding cattle. There's got to be a way that you can set this up so that when I arrive, all the cows are here that I need to check. So what they did is, is change the grouping strategy for the, the cows that needed to be checked. And we put headlocks up, they did. That reduced the veterinary time significantly. The drift was a farm with two brothers managing dairy cows. That's usually the first sign that things could go wrong when you have two dairy managers. So. They still talked to each other, by the way. It wasn't that they got to that point, but the, what happened was one guy was a bit of a show, he liked show cattle. So he decided he was gonna breed cattle towards 80 days voluntary weight, while the rest of them were getting bred more towards the 55 that was agreed to. So whether he wasn't in on the discussion on the protocol for breeding cows or what, but when we pulled these numbers up, it represented a significant number of days in milk because of this waiting to, to 80 days before we got semen in this cow. So this is quite a large dairy as well. What this represented was net almost $9,000. I've taken out all of any additional costs. So the headlocks that were purchased was part of the calculation as well. We amortized it out. The payment on, the, uh, on that loan is also calculated. The net at the end is 1.3% with that move. It's not something that happens overnight. And this was, again, I've only got up to 2015, the numbers on this. This is in progression. It'll only get better with time. So oh, my opinion. We started the presentation with uh, financial matrix. Micromanagement and financials. By definition, a matrix, matrix is something within or from which something else originates, develops, and takes form. So when you're under dairy, it's hard to, to, to look and have a vision and a plan to say, if I start something, where is it going to end? 
And this is where your management team becomes part of the solution. So what I did is I said, if I took all of those points that I just showed you a while ago, the variable, the real variable cost that we worked on, and I summarized it, what does it represent for 100 kilos of quota? And I was sh as shocked as anybody. It would represent 21% or $145,444 of money that would stay on the dairy for improvements or dividends or whatever was chosen. And you could say, yeah, but Devin, you can't, it's not, not, that's not right, it's not on all dairies, it's different areas. I get that. What I'm showing you is there's opportunities within your dairy to audit what you're doing to find margin. In any of the businesses that I've been involved with, and I don't think there's any of the producers that I've ever worked with would disagree with me, is we get myopic. We get uh, barn blindness. We're in our barns every day. We need to have people come in and help us find opportunity on our dairy. You know, dairy today has become a business. And the days of doing everything ourselves are, in my opinion, long gone. We can't do it. So, to close it out, I think that average might be the, a good start, starting point, but never should it ever be your end point. In certain provinces, uh, and there's financial institutions that say, well, we're okay we're average. Well, any business, is, if I'm average, I'm failing. I never want to be average. I don't think that we benchmark our regions and our areas well enough. I think that it has to be um, either farm groups or, or young producers. I see a lot of young producers out here today and that always is, is great. As I sort of end my career, and I'm just seeing one over there that I, I recognize, um, it's always great to see the next generation coming through and all I can recommend is find quality people to help you manage through the quagmire of business. So here's what I think is dairy farming run as a way of life is a really poor business. But dairy farming running, run as a business is a great way of life. And I, I speak to that because I, I have money in the industry and I can tell you that when I got involved in a little over 10 years ago, um, the family that I was investing with, they had a really poor quality of life. Sure, we buttered heads. I came in with some different ideas that they couldn't, couldn't really grasp initially. But if you were to ask them today, they actually take vacations. They actually go off the farm, which they never had done before. They have the means to do it. They now we have a management team on the dairy. The dairy runs well, and I can tell you that today there's a lot of robotic systems going in. And good, bad, or evil—that's for each farm to decide what they want to do. Um, but I can tell you one thing: that whether it be investments in robots or investments in people you still need management teams. So with that, I will thank you. And I will stick around for any questions.